this is a challenging topic. What Mark asked me to do was tell some stories about people that um, I feel were courageous leaders. And so I started to think about, well, what, what am I looking for in a courageous leader, and what is a courageous leader? And um, did a little bit of research on the word, and Mark had a wonderful definition, and, but it wasn't quite fitting my leaders, <laughs> so <laughs> I looked some more. And um, the, the definition that I found that fits the people I know in the co-op movement, who I feel are courageous, and there are many, many of them, is the clarification between physical courage when you're, you're in some kind of danger that you will be hurt or harmed or killed, and you take an action that you believe is right. You're physically in danger, and it's a courageous act because you're doing it when you're in physical danger. However, there's also a consideration of moral courage. And what I see in the co-op movement everywhere, and if I knew you all better, I think I would see it among all of you, is moral courage, which is, this is a quote, obviously, um, the ability to act rightly in the face of popular opposition, shame, scandal, discouragement, or personal loss. Do you want me to say that one more time? I think it's really important to think that moral courage is the ability to act rightly, whatever act rightly means, but also that the kind of um, danger you're in isn't a physical danger, it's much more a danger to your soul or your selfhood. In other words, um, popular opposition, shame, scandal, discouragement, you keep going. This is a lot of what, hap what I see happening in co-ops. We all keep going. And like the ever-ready uh, bunny, whatever that bunny is that keeps chugging along, ever-ready, right? Um, what? Energizer. Energizer, thank you. Well, so ever-ready you all are. <laughs> Um, and personal loss. So there are three people that I have looked to as um, models for what I wish I could have been, and I hope that maybe I was, some of this. And the three people that I look to are Abraham Shadid, Carol Greenwald, and David Smith. And I'm going to have to tell these stories quickly, so if you want to hear the longer versions, um, Excuse me, let me know. Uh, I'll be here for a while today. Abraham Shadid was uh, born in Lebanon. He um, put himself through school by being a pack seller. He <coughs> sold jewelry out of a pack on his back in Chicago to go to medical school. He ended up in Elk City, Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl. And if you can put yourself there, he had become a doctor by selling this jewelry. And um, he realized that there was um, a real problem in Elk City because there wasn't a hospital and there was no insurance. And farmers, because of the Dust Bowl, were losing their ability to produce their, produce their crops. And um, there was, if you read his biography, a kind of a cabal between the doctors, lawyers, and bankers to take advantage of farmers when they got sick on top of being part of the Dust Bowl, they'd, they'd take away their land and leave the farmers with no land. Shadid was very concerned about this, and he set up the first um, HMO in the country, which was a cooperative, and as was the model for Group Health of Puget Sound, if any of you know about them, our Group Health Cooperative here in Madison. He was opposed by the um, Oklahoma Medical Association threatened to take away his license to practice, and he was opposed by the American Medical Association. He kept going in face of that opposition and working with farmers co-ops in Oklahoma. And to me, that's a tremendous story. If you want to read it, the, his autobiography is Doctor for the People. It's a wonderful story. The second one is Carol Greenwald. Carol was the president of the National, at that time, National Consumers Cooperative Bank. It's now the National Cooperative Bank. And Carol and 
many, many other people um, that were involved with the bank realized that when um, President Reagan got elected and he put David Stockman, if any of you remember David Stockman, um, in as his director of the Office of Management and Budget, that um, the bank was going to, they were going to kill the bank. And they started putting these rules in that they, the money that had been appropriated by Congress, they weren't going to release. And to make a very long story short, uh, Carroll ultimately figured out a way that was, they believed, legal. The board supported her and other people, uh, national or um, NCBA supported her to put these two forms through that were the way that you get money out of um, the treasury one day after the other that requested $60 million to be released because the Reagan wasn't going to release the money to make the, the bank succeed. As a result of that, she was fighting the administration and it became characterized in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal as a fight between two presidents, the president of the United States and the president of this little bank, you know, serving co-ops, little people, right? It was the version from the administration. And Carol stuck it out under all of these accusations of being in the public, of being a thief and having um, orchestrated a heist and so forth. And, and the people that were supporting her stuck it out and eventually were victorious over the Reagan administration. That's why we have the co-op bank today. So my uh, third story is about David Smith. And David Smith was uh, a longtime chairman of the board of um, what's called Penn South. It's a mutual housing association. And limited equity, which means that um, people can buy into the co-op for a low amount of money and have low carrying charges. And so it's a more economical way to live. Penn South is a group of essentially almost 3,000 apartments in 12 buildings in downtown Manhattan. It was started by the International Ladies Garment Workers Union in 1962 as part of um, President Kennedy's move to have more cooperative and low, in, low and moderate income housing. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, it was designed to provide moderate income housing in downtown New York. Now you know how likely that is to find that. It was very successful. And they had gardens, they have their own electricity generating plant, they have a huge seniors program because a lot of the people that moved there stayed there. So they needed to have programs for seniors. It's a model housing situation. Thank you, Jan. Um, and what happened was the value, it's in Chelsea, if you knew, knew, know New York City, the value of the property, imagine this, um, 2,800 apartment units, um, the value of the property and of being in Chelsea increased partly because the co-op was there. And so the taxes kept going up. And so it became less and less feasible for the members to stay there at low rates. So developers thought, well, they won't be able to stay and we'll get them, the, the members, to vote to be a private housing and then buy it. So the members were faced with the opportunity to get hundreds, literally, hundreds of thousands of dollars for their apartments if they would vote to disband the co-op and end the limited equity housing. All right, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Dave Smith was the board chair. He did this more than once. This has happened more than once in their history. And he was telling me this story. And he was, he's a real um, dynamic and committed leader. And he's telling me these stories and he's describing to me how he talked to every member of that co-op. So that means almost you know, 3,000 people. And he says, I grabbed him by the shirt collar just like this. And I'm like, oh, dude. <laughs> he's got my collar, you know. And, and I told them that you could live here in New York, which you love, and you expected that your children could live here when they wanted to, 
and your grandchildren, and I'm telling you that if you pass this, you won't be able to stay, and there will be no place in the city where your family can live. We will lose the co-op. We will lose the opportunity for moderate income people to live in the city. And it went on like that. They had a vote. 75% of the members of the co-op participated in the vote. In the meantime, before, while they were waiting to have they announced the vote, the developers came back and said, not only will, you give these, will we pay you hundreds of thousands for your apartment, we will give you free a condo in Florida. This is a big deal. These are people, many of them were low income people and moderate income people. Now think about this, if you were faced with this choice. Would you sell, vote to sell, and go on, you know, beat it to Florida? Or what would you do? 70% of the people who voted, voted to keep the co-op. To me, that David Smith did that and fought it and fought it through all kinds of very heavy, um, discouraging kind of events was truly courageous. So I'm going to tell you again what courage is because we're in a time when there's tremendous opportunity for courage. You know, in great change, we're all faced with very difficult decisions and choices. So the ability to act rightly in the face of popular opposition, shame, scandal, discouragement, or personal loss. I've seen many of you do it. I know the rest of you have had this. You have a great opportunity right now in um, the cooperative movement to be a courageous leader. And go for it. Thank you.